All right, brothers and sisters, let's try this again. And uh, sometimes, no matter what you do, uh, technology has its little quips. And uh, so let's just pick right back up where we had left off. Now, I don't know just how long the video had frozen there at the end. Uh, Ryan, uh, I see that you're the first one there. How is the video? Is it good? Please let me know. Give me a thumbs up there or let me know, please. Um, ah, okay. Thank you, dear Sister Paulette. Uh, it looks like we might be uh, cooking with grease, as we say. Okay, so this is really great. All right, so we're glad we're able to work out the issues with the video. And when, excellent, excellent. Thanks for all the thumbs up, guys. I appreciate it. Um, and so here's what we were just discussing. I was discussing uh, this last God dream that I had two days ago, which uh, was a rapture dream in which I was being shown that we can know if we will seek out, and it's, it's seeking through the word of God. It's seeking God's face. It's seeking through him. We know that in, uh, what is it, Matthew chapter 7, he tells us to ask, seek, and knock, right? So all who ask, receive, all who seek will find, and all who knock, the door shall be open unto them. And this is really what I'm saying. But the interesting thing about this is, and I think it's important to point this out right now, is that it is the aorist tense in the Greek. And you go like, <laughs> what does that mean? Uh, what that means is that the it's, an, it, it's, it's a continuing thing. So in other words, uh, when you ask, it's not just ask, it's keep on asking. If you're seeking, keep on seeking. It's a continuous thing that you want to be able to do. If you're knocking, keep on knocking. And that's what we're talking about here. We're not just going to seek one time. We're not just going to ask one time. We're going to continue to do that. And, and think about this in terms of what, what, what is the thing that pops into my mind, <clears throat> excuse me, about that particular thing. Well, think about it when, uh, when uh, God is speaking to Abraham and talking about how he's going to destroy uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, right? And his, uh, his relative Lot is there. And so we have Abraham. He didn't just ask him one time, well, if there's, if there's 50 righteous there, you're not going to destroy it for 50 righteous, are you? No, nope, I wouldn't destroy it for 50 righteous. Oh, good, done deal. What does he do? He keeps, keeps going, right? Well, what about 40 or 30 or 20 all the way down in, 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 in various different 45, 40, 30, you know, you're going all the way down, but in each instance, all the way down to 10. And that's where he stops, right? But my point being that he continues seeking the Lord, right? And that's where we want to talk about right now. Now, here's one of the things, right, the difference, again, between the watching and the date setting. Now, I think that there's a lot of problems that can occur there. But one of the things that you're going to find, and, and uh, uh, Robert Breaker and many of you that are watching this now are familiar with him, evangelist Robert Breaker, and this is from a latest video that he did. And I, I, I want to mention what he says because it really kind of encapsulates what we're trying to say. And this is what he had in his description on this last video. It says, missionary evangelist Robert Breaker talks about, quote, date setting and how it can be a sin to set the date of the rapture by saying, Thus saith the Lord, the rapture will be on such and such a day, as I mentioned before. However, it is not a sin to make an educated guess of when the rapture might be, 
as long as someone makes it clear that they aren't being dogmatic about it and only presenting a possibility. He further shows an example of a preacher in 1988 to 1989 who talks about the possibility of the rapture coming back then, but without actually date setting. He further shows how Christians should love the appearing of Jesus Christ, amen, and desire his soon return, and that they should search the scriptures and try to look for clues to when he will return. Amen, amen, and amen on that. And that's really what we're talking about right now, folks, right? So we're watching and we're looking and we are expecting and hopefully you are desiring and you are filled with this hopeful expectation that Jesus is going to call up his bride any moment now. And I think this, this to me, it's very strong. So as we were looking at May 5th, and, and then we've got that, that, as some calling it, the, the true uh, Passover, some calling it the second Passover, but interestingly, falling on the same date, then uh, some looking at various different parts of this, other different dates and things that are being clustered, as you will, in this very small area of time. And, uh, and I think that it is definitely very much worthwhile to be watching and now. Now, here's what I want to say about this. And, and, it, and it gets to people. Some people are, uh, you, you know, saying like, well, aren't you raising people's hopes up? Well, I hope so, because I am very hopeful and I want to encourage everybody that this could really be it. And, and, and that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. Here's where it becomes problematic, as I see it. If you say, folks, this, this has got to be it. It's going to be on this day. I'm just, I, I'm so sure of it, right? Well, that's going to be a problem. So there are going to be people that are going to, sure, without a doubt, say that when this day comes and it passes, as many, of course, as we know, all of them that have been mentioned previously have passed, right? And then they just like, like the wind is just let out of their sails. Oh, no. Oh, no. It, it didn't come. I was so sure that was going to be it. Well, that's the problem, you see? We're not putting our faith in a date, brothers and sisters. We're putting our faith in Jesus, and that's where our faith needs to be. He's the one who's going to show us. We don't look at ourselves and then be able to say, well, okay, in my own, you know, thoughts processes, I've worked this out, the, you know, square root, the line, you know, okay. There's a lot of people that have these particular types of gifts, and we're putting it all together, and we're coming up with a picture, and we know we're there right? Uh, now, so when I say we know we're there, does that mean I'm date setting? No, that means I am firmly convinced, just like Jesus says, he says he's at the door. He said, look up when you see these uh, things, all of the many things, we're not going to cover all of them, right? But Jesus says himself, when you see all of these things begin to come to pass, not when they're over and done, not when they're in the past, he says, when you start seeing them begin to take place, what does he say? Look up, lift up your heads. And that means, now let's think about this a minute. Look up. If you're looking up, you're not looking down, right? You're not looking at the earth. What are we looking up at? Could we be looking at, at the signs in the heavens? What is everybody looking at now, right? Think about that. Look up, lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. Now, 
does he does does Jesus say that your redemption draws on May 5th of 2023 at no 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 he's not saying that does that mean that he couldn't or that he won't well obviously since May 5th has passed he's not going to do that right however we have plenty of signs and we keep watching the closer that we get with each day that passes we get closer to that very appointed day that God in his infinite wisdom and knowledge of all things had set in stone before the foundation of the very world itself. It's not a moving target, folks. It doesn't go around. And if those people are saying that, that for some that would say, well, we've got to make sure that that last person comes in. No, no, we don't. We plant the seeds. God the Father himself, he's going to make sure that that person comes in, right? He knows who that person is. We are not going to make that person come in. And we are not, there's nothing that we are going to do ourselves that's going to change God's mind or is going to, make him change the the appointed day that appointed day is the appointed day it will always be the appointed day it's not going to change right so what changes is our understanding about what that appointed day could be and that's what i want to say all right I, so what are we doing we're still looking we're looking for the glorious appearing of the great God and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. We are there. How do we want to be ready for this? How do we want to be ready for this? Well, I'm going to kind of shift gears for a moment. And I'm going to talk about a kind of touchy subject, but I, it needs to be said, especially now, because I'm going to make this blanket statement, and then I'm going to go in and discuss it in detail. The rapture of the bride, which is one of three harvests, one of three, one of three. You may not like it. You may just want to come up with every excuse that you want to and bah humbug, there's only one. There's only ever been one. I can't find it in scripture anywhere else that there's more than one. Okay, just listen to what I'm saying before you just close your mind to anything that the Lord might want to be revealing to you. That pre-tribulational rapture of the bride is a reward. It's a reward. And you may buy and humbug about that, but it's a reward. And I'm going to show you. And the reason why that it's this hyper grace movement that is a problem. Yes, it's a problem. Why? Because there's false teaching there. And we're going to ferret that out right now. And what is that false teaching that I am going to point out to you? It's the false teaching that you do not have to repent of sin after you're saved. Mm. Let's get into this. The ones that are staunch supporters of the hyper grace movement, they're very... They tend to be, now I've got, I'm using a broad, generalized brush, so of course, bear with me. They tend to be, in general, very sarcastic about anyone else that holds an opposing view. They know themselves what the truth is, right? And because of that, I think that religious pride that they have within, yes, that's a religious pride. It closes them off to God actually being able to reveal to them what he's trying to reveal to them, right? All right. What I want to do is I, I, I want to discuss, first off, 
and, and I'm going to discuss about the hyper grace movement. But first, I want to focus on this main point about uh, about sin. What did Jesus do when he came the first time? He saved us from the penalty of sin, right? He did not save us from the consequences of sin. Let me say that again. He saved us from the penalty of sin. Now, that's assuming those that have accepted that free gift. They are saved. I am saved. You are saved from the penalty of sin. But if you have sin, you are not saved from the consequences of those sins. Now, think about it. Just like right now, let's look at this. And Are you getting older? I certainly am. Uh, it, are, are, are things starting to break and fall apart? Yes, yes, they are. I, 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 th I think I'm in pretty good shape, but things happen. I mean, you know, like I, I still have zits, just like a teenager. And it's just really thick. But what's the thing? Things happen. We get older. We get wrinkles. Our hair turns gray. Well, I, I've got kind of some grace there. But, uh, uh, you know, that type of thing. Things happen. Why? It's a consequence of sin, right? Okay. We will ultimately have a resurrection body that will not have that anymore. We don't have that yet. Okay. All right. We do not have that yet. We're going to talk about sin and God hates it. Okay. And you don't want it in your life. But if you're going to sit like a bump on a log thinking you don't have to do anything about it yourself because that's works or legalism, that's a big, big problem and a big, big mistake. All right. So we're going to discuss that. Clearly, I've, and uh, what I want to establish, not clearly, you know, everyone who knows me, I hate to use that. What I want to do is I want to establish in as plain and simple terms as possible that there is a price and penalty for sin. Jesus came to pay that price, and if you don't accept it as the free gift that's being offered, if you don't accept that free gift, then that penalty still rests on you. But you, if you've accepted that free gift, then you are forgiven and no longer have that penalty resting on you. All right, we're going to cover that. But the consequences remain. If you are going to sin, you have consequences. And we have that throughout the Bible. So what I'm going to do is I, I really, in a lot of instances, gotquestions.org really is, it goes into some detail, and I really think this is going to be helpful as we discuss this now, because you don't want the sin if you want the pre-trib rapture. Now, follow me. I'm not saying sin-free. I'm saying repentance of, okay? So we're going to cover this in detail. What happens? What has happened? What happens if you don't repent? Why do you need to repent? And what happens even if you do repent? Okay, let's follow this for a minute. So on gotquestions.org, the question is, if Jesus paid the price for our sin, why do we still suffer the consequences of our sin? <clears throat> Excuse me, let me take a quick drink. Ah, thank you. Abba. All right. Here's the answer that he gives. <clears throat> All right. The Bible gives the good news that Jesus paid the price for our sins in Ephesians 1.7. Yet, in many ways, we still suffer the consequences of our sins. For example, a drug dealer may become a Christian in prison, but that doesn't mean he will be released from prison the next day. 
he will still experience the consequences of his past sin. A born-again Christian who falls into adultery may lose his family, his career, etc. Even after he confesses and forsakes his sin, the consequences of his sin remain. Coming to Christ does not erase the temporal effects of sin. That's the effects on the earth. That does not happen. Our salvation guarantees, however, that we will not face the eternal consequences of sin, right? Now, so what are the consequences of sin? Well, Romans 6.23 says that the wages of sin is death, right? As sinners, we deserve to be eternally separated from God and his holiness. On the cross, Christ paid for the penalty of our sin, excuse me, with his own blood. He who knew no sin was made to be sin on our behalf. That's 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21. On the basis of Christ's perfect sacrifice, those who believe are no longer under God's condemnation, right? Romans 8, verse 1. It is important to understand that when the believer in Christ experiences consequences for sin, it is not because he is under God's condemnation. His wrath as we see in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 9, or his retribution, 2 Thessalonians 1, verse 8, believers are under God's grace. Now, this is where we get into and we discuss, is there grace? Yes. For all sin? Yes. Okay. But... There's so much that's wrong with where hypergrace is going for that, okay? And that's what we want to discuss. All right. Um, believers are under God's grace. Jesus took the wrath of God upon himself. That's Isaiah 53, verse 10. Sin's consequences still experienced by believers could be classed in these ways, right? One, universal consequences. Now, some of sin's consequences are experienced perpetually by every human being on earth because we are all children of Adam. We all have weeds growing in our gardens. We all face natural, natural disasters. We all get sick and grow old and we all eventually die physically. That's Romans 5, verse 12. All sinners living in a sinful world, there's no avoiding these consequences of original sin. That's the universal consequences, what I was just talking about. It happens. Then we have the natural consequences for sin. We live in a world of cause and effect where the law of sowing and reaping is in full effect. Some of sin's consequences are built in and practically guaranteed, no matter if the sinner is saved or unsaved. The Bible warns that sexual immorality is a sin committed against one's own body. Can a man scoop fire into his lap without his clothes being burned? That's Proverbs 6.27. If you steal something, you should expect to get caught and face the natural consequences that follow the sin of theft. If you resist arrest, when you get caught, you pile on more consequences, sowing and reaping. You reap what you sow. Then we have the instructional consequences. Very likely, God allows some of sin's consequences to remain in our lives to teach us the heinous nature of sin and to remind us to depend upon God's grace. Sin is a serious enough problem to God to have sent his son into the world to die. Amen. 
we dare not take sin lightly. In the face of sin's consequences, we humble ourselves and seek God's kingdom and righteousness all the more. When Ananias and Sapphira were disciplined for their sin, it was instructive for the church. Great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. Disciplinary consequences. Some of sin's own consequences are the result of God's treating us as a father should his children. There's a difference between a penalty for sin and discipline for sin. Amen? Think about that. Let that resonate down in you. As God's children, we experience discipline designed to guide us back to the right path. Here's the scripture. My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord's disciplines, the Lord disciplines the one he loves and he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. That's Hebrews 12, five and six. And we can cross-reference that with Proverbs 3, 11 and 12. Note how many of God's children undergo discipline. Did you hear that? Everyone. Everyone. Okay? We're all wayward at times. God's purpose in allowing us to experience disciplinary consequences of sin, true to his nature, is perfect. God disciplines us for our good in order that we may share in his holiness. Hebrews 12, verse 10. The Church of Corinth provides an example of Christians facing a, the disciplinary consequences of their sin in partaking of the Lord's table in an unworthy manner. They brought God displeasure. That is why many, this is the scripture, that is why many among you are weak and sick and a number of you have fallen asleep or died. That's 1 Corinthians 11.30. We see similar disciplinary action taken in 2 Samuel chapter 12. Even after David confessed his sin and was forgiven, God allowed certain consequences to befall David and his household. Right? God allows us to experience some of the temporal consequences of sin to show us his love for us, brothers and sisters. If God never disciplined his straying children, he would not be a good father. If we were never disciplined or never suffered the consequences of our wrong action, we would never learn right from wrong. We tend to learn from our mistakes more readily than we learn from our successes. Amen. Praise the Lord for his goodness. Amen. He allows us to experience the temporal consequences of sin for our own good. But he has saved us from the eternal consequences of sin. Jesus paid the penalty for our sins so that we will never experience the second death, which is the lake of fire. Believers in Christ are promised that the curse and consequences of sin will be removed completely one day and nothing will hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. Isaiah 11 verse 9. That will happen, brothers and sisters, one day, one day, but not yet. Until that time, we have to grow, learn, and yes, we fall. But when we're God's child, we're expected to get back up. We're expected to learn from those mistakes. We're expected to ask for forgiveness of those sins, to be cleansed from all unrighteousness, and move forward from there. Okay? Now, let's... Just take a look for a moment about, about this hyper-grace uh, type of approach. And I'm going to use uh, 
that this very same issue, uh, let's see, yeah, all right, this very same issue of consequences of sin. Now, I'm going to read through this, and it's going to, to cover it, and I'm hoping that if you are on this side, that you are really going to question, bring this to the Lord. And that's that's the thing, right? He's going like, well, no, I don't need to bring it to the Lord. God's already forgiven me for all my past, present, and future sins that I am yet to uh, yet to do, right? Mm, okay. Well, I would say that that's one way that the enemy is keeping you from drawing close to God. Okay, just saying. All right. So let's talk about that. What is hyper grace? And again. This is from gotquestions.org. So I'm going to show you that it's the same type of thing that fits in here. Answer. The term hypergrace has been used to describe a new wave of teaching that emphasizes the grace of God to the exclusion of all other vital teachings, such as repentance and confession of sin. Hypergrace teachers maintain that all sin, past, present, and future, has already been forgiven, so there's no need for a believer to ever, ever confess it. Hypergrace teaching says that when God looks at us, he sees only a holy and righteous people. The conclusion of hypergrace teaching is that we are not bound by Jesus' teaching even as we are not under the law, that believers are not responsible for their sin, and that anyone who disagrees is a pharisaical legalist. In short, hyper-grace teachers pervert the grace of our God into a license for immorality, that's Jude 1.4, and flirt with antinomianism. Jesus' words to the seven churches in the book of Revelation strongly contradict the idea that Christians never need that. To the church of Ephesus, Jesus said, Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. Revelation 2, verse 4. Jesus rebukes five of the seven churches and demands repentance from them. That's Revelation 2, verse 4, 6, 20, Revelation 3, verse 3, and 15 through 17, or excuse me, 19. Far from believers being unaccountable for their sin, they must answer to Jesus for their disobedience. See also 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10. Preachers of hyper-grace doctrine discount the Old Testament and the Ten Commandments as irrelevant to New Testament believers. They even teach that Jesus' words spoken before his resurrection are part of the Old Covenant and no longer applicable to born-again believers. But is this true? In Mark 13, verse 31, Jesus said, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Before Jesus ascended into heaven, he promised that the Father would send the Holy Spirit who will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I said to you. John 14, verse 26. If Jesus' words are no longer applicable to believers, why would we need to be reminded of them? Hmm. Hypergrace teaching is a good example of mixing truth with error. An emphasis on the beauty and power of God's grace is good. But some teachers are neglecting what Paul called the whole counsel of God in Acts 20, verse 27. For example, it is true that Christians have been forgiven by God. But that doesn't mean that we never have to confess our sins. 
James 5 verse 16 says, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. If we are to confess our sins to each other, why would we not need to confess them to God? Since every sin is ultimately a sin against God, that's in Psalm 51 verse 4. Also, 1 John 1 verse 9 gives clear instruction to believers about confessing sin. It begins with the word if. And that's a very big conditional word that we use in law, okay? If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What does that mean? If you could do it, if there is a condition that says, if you do the condition, this will happen. But if you do not do the condition, that will not happen, right? This is a cause and effect statement implying that we cannot have the second without the first. As blood-bought children of God, we do not continue to confess our sin in order to be saved from hell. That's true. Understand that. That's what we're saying. We're not saying we're confessing this sin to be saved. We're saying we're confessing that sin to be cleansed, right? All right. We confess and repent in order to reestablish an intimate relationship with our Father. We are positionally righteous, but practically sinful, right? And I, I think this is a very important part. And it's one thing that I mention uh, often, and that is about desiring to have a deeply personal and intimate relationship with Jesus, right? Sin separates us from Jesus, separates us from God, right? And we need to be cleansed so that we can draw into that closer relationship. That's what we need to do. But however, to counter this argument, hyper grace teachers deny that John's letters were written to believers. What? However, 1 John 2 verse 1 begins with this, my dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. John is clearly, now those are his words, not mine, writing to believers whom he personally knew. He indicates that his believing friends may indeed sin and that when they do, they need to confess it. Hypergrace preachers also claim that the Holy Spirit will never convict Christians of their sin. God forbid. Mature Christians should recognize this fallacy right away. Every disciple of Christ has felt the overwhelming conviction of the Holy Spirit when he or she has sinned. Jesus calls the Holy Spirit the spirit of truth in John 15, verse 26. Truth, by its very definition, will not tolerate anything false. When the spirit of truth abides in a believing heart, he brings conviction about anything that is not the truth. In summary, much of what the hyper-grace preachers teach is valid. And we acknowledge that, right? We are indeed saved by grace, not by works, according to Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9. And God's grace is marvelous, great, and free, 1 Timothy 1, 14. However, hyper-grace teaching is out of proportion with the rest of Scripture. Anytime one doctrine is emphasized to the exclusion of the rest, we fall into error because we fail to, quote, correctly handle the word, 2 Timothy 2.15. Rightly dividing is what it's in in the King James, but it means how to correctly handle the truth, right? 
Jesus was full of both grace and truth, John 1, 14. The two are in delicate balance and a tip to either side can result in a false gospel. We must always compare any new teaching with the whole counsel of God. The whole counsel, not parts, not just parts that you want to cling on to, parts that you want to highlight to the exclusion of any others, right? We must always compare any teaching with the whole counsel and learn to disregard anything that veers even slightly from the truth. And that's 1 John 4, verse 1. And so for our brothers and sisters that are holding on to this hyper-grace teaching, there is so much that you are missing out on. And what's most important about that is a deeply intimate relationship with God. Why? Because sin separates you from that. You want to boldly go before the throne of grace, right? And, and receive mercy in your time of need, right? That's what we want to be able to do. We, when, when we, what, what happened to the prodigal son? He said, I want to go back to my father, right? That's what he wants to do. The father wants you to come back to him. And that sin separates you from that. But what's another big issue that happens from this hyper grace movement? They will tend to say that, look, there's no problem with sin. You're forgiven with all of that sin. And the only thing that you have to worry about is losing some rewards, okay? First off, just to minimize the eternal rewards of God in heaven just astounds me. Oh, yeah, it's not such a big deal. It's just some rewards. That, to me, sounds like an excuse to remain in your earthly sin because you like the sin. You don't like the rewards. Then you don't value the rewards. And they don't mean anything to you. Therefore, you're not going to try to get any of the rewards, right? So, uh, but God offers the rewards to us. And he, so here's the thing. If you're going to lose the rewards, this is one of the things that the hyper grace crew does not understand, is that the pre-tribulation harvest, as I mentioned before, one of three separate harvests, one's pre-trib, one's mid-trib, one is post-trib, and it, there's, there's a lot around that. There's a lot that's been revealed in that. And that is one of the things that I would encourage you to look at. And that first pre-trib harvest of the bride of Christ is a reward. Let me say that again, because what they want to say is, nope, what we've done is once you've accepted God, you get everything. You don't have to try to get everything, and they have to change this from being a reward to something you just automatically get. You just tick the boxes, right? You don't have to do anything. You've got the, here's the golden ticket, and you get everything, and it's all free. No, it does not say that. Rewards are not free. They are earned. Grace and the free gift of eternal life, that is a free gift, but it doesn't say free rewards, right? They have to say that it's not a reward and that they include it as part of some salvation package, right? I've mentioned a number of times that when, you know, they have to they have to look at another part of scripture, but every instance where the scripture talks about uh, salvation and it being a free gift of God, it doesn't say anything about rapture. It doesn't say anything about rewards, right? It says about the free gift. The free gift is eternal life. It doesn't say that, oh, we're also going to include at no extra charge this, 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 and this. This is not like getting a, a car, right? This is not how you do that. And if you accept this, 
absolutely free. We will include at no extra charge. So a pre-tribulation rapture of the church. And we will also include a resurrection body, right? Well, you will be able to get a resurrection body, but you're not going to be able to get the pre-tribulation rapture of the church. Why? Because you have more than one. The apostle Paul tells us there is an order to these things. And there's so much scripture that I have covered so many, many times, not just myself, but others and many more are seeing it now that the pre-trib rapture is something to be desired, sought after, and as the Apostle Paul tells us, like going after the win in a race. That's what you do. That's what we're doing here. You don't just sit back and go like, yeah, you know, I'm really not interested in winning the race. I, I've made it up. I'm starting. I'm just going to kind of walk across to the finish line and that sort of thing. And effectively, I know that seems like it's it, it, that I'm being pedantic about it or something else, but God looks at it very strongly. And here's the thing. I personally desire so deeply, so deeply to have that personal relationship with my Jesus. It is something that drives me deep down inside of me. And those that are part of the bride know that. If you don't make the pre-trib rapture, are you still going to have an opportunity? Yes, to be a part of a rapture harvest? Yes. But you're not going to be able to be part of this most awesome eternal reward. And that is being in the group that is the bride of Christ that is harvested, gathered, raptured, taken, seized, whichever term you want to be able to use in the pre-tribulation gathering, okay? I'm, I'm, I'm trying to encourage you, desire that. If you don't have that desire in your hearts, ask for it. Ask for it, brothers and sisters. And if you are not yet a brother and sister in Christ, you want to know this, Jesus. Jesus loves you. He loves you more than you can possibly imagine. And he's about to call up his bride any moment now, any moment now. I believe that to be the case. Now, am I doing this date setting thing? No, I'm not. If it doesn't happen today, I'm going to be looking for tomorrow. If it doesn't happen tomorrow, I'm going to be looking to the next day. I'm going to keep looking because that's what he told me to do. And I'm going to keep proclaiming that very thing to every one of you because it is so incredibly close, incredibly close right now. I, I just keep glancing, you know, uh, out my window, I keep thinking like, now, 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 it is that close. I really believe that. All right, brothers and sisters, I am going to go ahead and let you go now, but let's keep looking up. Let this be an encouragement to all of you. And let me say to those of you that don't know Jesus, I encourage you to just do this now. Go to a place where you can just talk to him. I don't, it doesn't matter. Jesus is real. He's alive and he's right there with you. And all you have to do is acknowledge to him that I am a sinner. And I know I can't pay that penalty for that sin, but I know that you did, Jesus. You were the only one that could. And you offer it to me as a free gift because you died and you were buried and you rose again after three days. I believe all of that. I believe it. 
I believe you are the son of God. I believe that you paid that penalty for me. And I accept that free gift now. I'm asking you to cleanse me of my sin. Make me a member of the family. I want to know you. Do that for me now in Jesus' name. Amen. All right? If you, if you do that, if you've prayed that, I am so happy for you. Angels in heaven right now are actually praising you, clapping and just, just really acknowledging there's a joyous round of applause that's going on in heaven right now for what you have just done. And you are now eternally freed from the penalty of that sin. But don't stop there. Don't stop there. Go out and tell someone, okay? Let someone know the decision that you just made. And we look forward to seeing you. Brothers and sisters, I so look forward to seeing you. Do not be discouraged in any way. Do not, because we have taken one more step closer to that sky being opened up the trumpet to sound, and for Jesus to say, come up here. Amen. Maranatha, brothers and sisters, we'll see you in the clouds.